Come on, you can do better than that. Let's praise God. And let's praise God for a true man of God, Apostle Clarence Langston. Uh, I don't take this uh, privilege lightly to be here before you today because this is a holy desk. You know, being in the church world for a long time, you see and experience a lot of things. But I'm telling you this. You have to recognize when you're in a true man of God's presence. So thank you, Apostle, for being that true man of God. Uh, really quick, I'm going to have a video play to set the stage for what I'm going to be talking about. And then I'll be right back. It'll be very quick. What's going on? Everybody okay? They got a call, said there was trouble in the house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you all need to look around. It's a little wet for practice, don't you think? None of the girls have schoolwork to do. They do their homework. Tundi's first in her class. Lynn and Isha are too. Now I don't even mind you saying we hard on these kids. You know why? Because we are. That's our job, to keep them off these streets. You want to check on the kids? Let's check on the kids. We got future doctors, lawyers, plus a couple of tennis stars in this house. The chances of achieving the kind of success that you're talking about is just very, very unlikely. Okay, you make a mistake, but I'm gonna let you make it. Watch them hit a few balls. All right. So tell me your names again. I'm Venus. I'm Serena. So what'd you think? I wrote me a 78-page plan for their whole career before they was even born. Yeah, baby, yeah! <laughs> These girls are so great, how come I've never heard of them? They're from Compton. It's okay. They're just not used to seeing good-looking peoples like us. Yeah, yeah. She's nervous. Take a step up. Maybe she ought to take a few more steps up. Just get someplace safe. I think you might just have the next Michael Jordan. Oh, no, brother man. I got me the next, too. This next step you got to take. You're not gonna just be representing you, you're gonna be representing every little black girl on earth. I'm not gonna let you doubt. I'll cook you. This world ain't never had no respect for Richard Williams, but they gonna respect y'all. You don't walk out there with your head up. You are a champion, and the whole world know it. creature on this whole earth. And it's a woman who know how to think. Yes, Daddy. Ain't nothing she can't do. You gonna show them how dangerous you are? Venus and Serena gonna shake up this world. Venus Williams, who is your best friend? Hey, Daddy. Serena Williams, who is your best friend? Venus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's just praise God one more time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, I won't be before you long. Uh, if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter number one, verse number 27, 26 through 27. And it reads, then God said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness. And let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle of, over the entire earth and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image and in like, his image and likeness and God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Jumping over to John 14, 7 through 11, it reads, If you had really known me, you would have also known my father. For now on, you will know him and have seen me. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and then we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long of time and you don't know me yet, Philip, nor recognize clearly who I am? Anyone who do see me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not say on my own in, uh, initiative or authority. I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. But the Father abiding continually in me does his work, his attesting miracles and acts of power. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe me because of the very work themselves 
which you have witnessed. I want to take just a few minutes to speak on the subject. When you see me, you see my father. When you see me, you see my father. Today is a special day as we uh, honor fathers all over the world, the fathers that are in this room. Uh, a special honor to our spiritual father, Apostle Clarence Langston. Yes, a true father and an example. Our fathers that are joining us online, the fathers of like mine that are no longer on the earth, and most of all, our heavenly father. When we look at the origin of Father's Day, we see that this day was a day that uh, came up a long time ago that a church had sponsored an event uh, for it to be a national event. And this event was on July 5th of 1908 in West Virginia. Churches sponsored this national event so that they could honor the fathers of, uh, the fathers of a few children that had died uh, on a Sunday that were involved with a coal mining accident. There was an explosion that had happened that had killed 362 men. Wow. After this explosion had happened, there was a gathering to celebrate and honor these men, but that was just a one-time occurrence that had happened. As we go on the next year, there was a woman named Sonora Smart Dobb. She was one of six children who was affected by the explosion that happened because she had lost her father. She was determined to create this honorable holiday. She went to local churches. She went to the YMCA. She went to shopkeepers. She went to the government. And after trying and trying again and finally pleading with the right individual, she was successful. This now national holiday that we're selling, celebrating today actually goes back to this exact date, 112 years. However, it wasn't until 1972, which was 58 years after President Woodrow Wilson had already made Mother's Day official. Now this national holiday will be forever remembered because there was a young girl that had decided that above all things that she wanted to honor her father like no one else had done. And although fathers are now honored and celebrated on this day nationally, it's still a staggering statistics that we see when it concerns fatherless homes. When we look at a few of the statistics that we see when it comes to fatherless homes, we see that 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. Seven out of every 10 youth that are housed in state-operated correctional facilities, including detention centers and residential treatments, come from a fatherless home. 39% of the students in the United States from first grade to their senior year of high school do not have a father at home. Children without a father are four times more likely to be living in poverty than, a children, with a, with, than children with a father. 57% of the fatherless homes in the United States are involving African-American or black people. Hispanic households have 31% and Caucasian homes 20%. Children who live in a single parent home are more than two times more likely to commit suicide than children in a two parent home. Fathers, this is exactly why we need you. We need your presence. We need you to cultivate. We need you to dig out. We need you to be the covering because when we don't have the fathers in place, the devil runs rapid and we lose the next generation. It's alarming to think that so many people in our nation are dealing with father, fatherlessness. But I got good news for you because when we look in the Bible, we can see that even David testified over in Psalm 68 and 5. And he said that our God is a father to the fatherless. So no matter what, if you grew up and you fell in the statistic or you've been going through things where you didn't have your father or maybe your father wasn't the best. When you come to God, he's able and willing to bring you through the statistics and put you on top of everybody else. When we look at the meaning of the word father and we look in the Old Testament in the Hebrew, it's Abba. When we look in the New Testament, we see the Greek word pater. 
Both of these words have the same meaning, which is source, sustainer, nourisher, supporter, founder, and protector. So when we look at the beginning of creation and we see our God in action, we're able to see how the father of creation worked and operated. We see how he treated the heavens. He created the heavens and the earth. He let it be light, and it was light. The sky, the dry land, the seas, the plants, the trees, the animals, and then right. finally created us, humanity in his image and likeness when we look at Genesis 1 26 through 27 we see where it says then God said let us the Father Son and the Holy Spirit make man in our image according to our likeness not physical but a spiritual personality and moral likeness and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea the birds of the air the cattle and over the entire earth of over everything that creepeth and crawleth on the earth so God created man in his own image and the likeness right. of God he created him male and female he created them when we see in the text is that God is a good father by creating and putting everything in place before he even created the man. We can see how God set the stars in the sky. He set the landscape. He had the cattle. He had the fish. He had the birds. And then once he set everything up, he said, I'm going to create a miniature me to rule and have dominion over it all. When we look at this, we can see how God has created us in his image and his likeness. Now we're in Genesis, so we're dealing with Adam and we're looking at how God had planned for things to be. God expected for us to keep a pureness of our image and likeness in him him so that we could humbly come to him directly at the time and so when we come to him we would have a relationship with him but when we look in the text we know the story of how Adam Adam got off track because of a decision that he made through his wife when we look at it we, I want you to see and notice God's order that before I go into the story that God had a plan for the man he had everything in place before he did this. And this is an example to me coming up as a father and to fathers because he is the master father that God has as a father everything in place before he has the children and the seeds to come after him. That God is the source. And because he's the source and the sustainer, that means anything that he produces and he gives out, he's going to support it and he's going to sustain it. So when we become fathers, as I watch my spiritual father, I have a live example to see what that it looks like when it looks like to have now children and now when the children are in the earth what it looks like to sustain them and to support them and this is what you have to realize when we're preaching out of the word because I know it can be hard to see sometimes but God is so good that he'll put something in the text that you may not be able to understand right there but when you can't fully get it he'll bring somebody in your presence so you can see what it looks like So Satan came and tempted her because he had direct instructions, because Adam had direct instructions from God. When the temptation came to Eve, it wasn't even that much of a demand on her because if you think about it, Eve came out of the side of Adam, which means that he was her source. God created Adam from the dirt and he made and formed him. So God was his source. So when God gave Adam the instruction and Adam gave Eve the instruction, she, when she ate the fruit, it wasn't her that did it that caused man to slip into humanity. But it was when she brought it to Adam and Adam then partook of the fruit, then we see now that he he directly disobeyed God, which caused, caused sin, which caused him to fall out of fellowship and had to go out of the presence of God. People of God, I want to warn you that the enemy has been in your ear. He's been trying to get in your track and try to get you off track because he knew that if you get off track, that you were going to get out of the presence of God. You better recognize that when you get out of the presence of God, that you're setting yourself up for failure. A point that I've seen is that a good father will always make a plan. He'll always sustain. When Apostle formed this ministry, he speaks about the plan that he had. Was the plan 12 years? A 12-year plan that he had before he started the ministry. And the plan that he had, God honored and made everything that he had in that plan come 
to pass. We can see the scripture behind it, which is Habakkuk 2.2 2, that says, write the vision and make it plain. Even God has commanded you and told you that if you write out the plan, if you have something that you're trying to sustain and you have the plan for it and you're living by my principles, wow. I will honor you and honor your plan and make it come to pass. Wow. When I look at growing up my grandfather, my granddad on my dad's side was a strong advocate for education and making sure that we stayed out of trouble. That was his biggest things. As men, he wanted to make sure that we went to school, we did a trade, or we did something and we stayed out of trouble. And looking at that, he became a great father, even though he didn't have a father. And I want to look at that because even though he didn't have a father, sometimes by not having a father, it will teach you how to be a better father. Because he was in the lives of his children. He was in the lives of my, my, my dad and my uncles and aunts and everybody that was there. Although he didn't have it perfect, although he could have did some things differently, but what he did was he put forth his best effort by trying to be the man that he didn't have in his own life. And so I look at even that story and I think about, wow, I wonder how much further he would have been if he would have gotten more in the church or if he would have gotten more connected to God. And the reason I say that is because I know I'm drawing a comparison, but we look at the example of our apostle where he might not have had his dad the way that he wanted to have him in his life. But at the same time, instead of figuring out on his own, God gave him a spiritual father to supplement what he was missing. And because he gave him the supplement of what he was missing, now you're looking at the fruits of his labor and how God has brought him to where he is today. So when we look at my grandfather and he pushed education, he pushed um, being out of trouble, God still honored him. For, for, for that prayer that he had, even though he didn't grow up in church, or actually, it was crazy, I was talking to some of my uncles, they didn't even know this. I talked to my grandfather in the last year of his life, and we were talking about God, and, you know, he was like, he was telling me, I actually do believe in God. I, I, I might not have been in church, but I really do. I love God. And growing up, I actually used to be a Sunday school teacher. And I told my uncles that they didn't even know, and I said, wow, really? <laughs> so I used to be a Sunday school teacher. He said, but you know what? Sometime as a young man, you get off track, and I, I never made my way back. Wow. And I think about that, and I think about how, even today, how I'm standing here. Wow. I believe that even whatever that season was, that he was in there tapped in with God, that God heard his prayer enough to jump in his seed, to go wow. down the generations and bless the next ones coming. I want to tell somebody in here that you got to look and think about your seed when you're making the decisions that you make. Because when you go forward, you might be blessing your next generation. Wow. When we... Look at the story of what was on the screen, which was called King Richard. This was the story that was based on the movie of uh, Richard Williams, who was the father of Serena and Venus Williams. This story talks about a man who was from the South. The man who was from the South had a vision and a plan, a 78-page plan wow. to raise his daughters to be tennis players, and they weren't even born yet. Wow. He had a plan in place before they were even born. He said that he saw a tennis match one day, and a girl made $40,000 in four days, and he said, you know what? I'm going to raise my daughters to be tennis players. And he raised them to be tennis players. And look at how he saw that. And he cultivated his daughters. He had a plan. He cultivated them. He said, you're going to be the greatest. He instilled in them that you are the greatest. He put the work in and spent time with them on the court. The man learned how to play tennis when nobody showed him how. He bought instructional videos. He watched wow. uh, different, walk, walk, uh, read different books. He took the steps necessary because he knew that if anybody was going to cultivate his seed, that he was going to have to be the one to do it. Fathers and young men, as we're coming up, we're going to have to invest in what we want to work. If you're going to read the word and get in it and see how to work it and apply it, you got to get on the church services so you can learn what to do. You got to 
read the business book so you can teach your sons and daughters how to do it. When you invest in your seed, then you'll be able to see the fruits of your labor. Wow. So King Richard didn't have his father. Tell the story about how when he was five years old, this is in an interview, not even the movie, but he said when he was five years old, he grew up in the South and I guess you weren't supposed to touch a Caucasian person's hand and he put the change in his hand and touched him and the man jumped him and he said when he looked up, he saw his father running through the crowd. He said at that moment, he was abandoned. He felt like he had to defend himself. And from that moment on, when you listen to any of his interviews, he doesn't say anything else about his father. Wow. So when we look at that, I can see and read between the lines that even though he didn't have the example of the father that he had, that man did everything he could to protect his daughters. Wow. He did everything he could to protect them. And when, when we look at how he then when he brought them up and how they started to play tennis and they started to get better and he was excited about it and he started to then look for other people to work with them and to cultivate them and to take them farther than he could. Something I thought that was interesting too, he actually... When he learned how to play tennis, he taught his wife how to play tennis so that they together could teach them how to play tennis. Look at how the principle of this is in the natural, but this is how God designed it in the spirit. God wanted the man to learn his ways and his principles, to then teach them to his wife so that Adam and Eve could then teach them to their children. And when they teach it to them, now you have the cycle of how it is that we're supposed to live for God. And when that's done, now they will then pass it to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. This is how we're blessed at Word and Action Christian Center because we have a spiritual father. We don't just have regular pastors, but we have a spiritual father. So even in the example of how King Richard or Richard Williams, he at a certain point had took his daughters as far as he could go in that lane because he understood that he only knew so much. He then got an expert in that field to help carry them the rest of the way. When it comes to your spiritual life, you don't got to figure it out on your own. You have pastors and spiritual fathers that will and mothers that will teach you how to do and how to live for, the for God. This is what Apostle Paul was talking about when he said in 1 Corinthians 4 and 15, for even if you were to have 10,000 instructors to guide you in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers who lead you to Christ and assumed responsibility for you, wow. for I become your father in Christ Jesus through the good news of salvation. We don't just have an instructor here, but he looks over our souls. When we look at that, I'm, I'm excited because it's like I explained to you at the beginning. I grew up in church, so I've seen a lot. I understand that this, what we have here, is not normal. God has blessed Word in Action Christian Center with great leaders that you can trust, that you can look up to, that will teach you if you listen. And when you get under that, you, it's hard to accept sometimes, but you have to get under it and glean from it. Just stick around for a while. You'll catch something. I, I had a great father. My own father was in my life. Uh, at the age of 18, he lost his kidneys. He was sick basically my whole life uh, on dialysis. He had a couple of uh, kidney plants, transplants and things like that. But I had an amazing father. My father was there at anything. He put me in different activities and sports, whatever I wanted to do. He taught me how to swim. He took me out of town. Whatever it was, my father was there. I had the type of father, he honestly reminds me of Apostle, and I think that's why I, I drew to him so much, because I had the type of father where um, I never had like a, a serious problem with anyone or anything like that, but if I had one, I would be more scared to tell my father about it because I knew that he was going to do something about it. I had that kind of father that I knew that no matter what, if I called him, you better know he's going to show up in the next couple of minutes. So to have that kind of father, to grow up with that, to have that kind of love, and then for him to then grow, and then he put me in church at a young wow. age. So he brought me to God. Wow. Whatever he couldn't teach me, I learned at, while I was in church. And so then I began to grow. I began to grow. And then there became times as I began to get older because he brought me to God that that God peace that he gave to me was able to then give back to him. Because wow. there were times where on the journey where he would get sick and he was in the hospital. And it was a time where earlier on where 
everybody thought he was getting ready to die. The doctors had told him basically there was nothing else they could do. He was allergic to penicillin, and that was the thing he needed in order to fight the infection in his bloodstream. And so nobody really knew at that time what they could do. I remember that all I knew and would hear about, I grew up in the old school church, and they would talk about going in the prayer closet. Now, I didn't have a prayer closet, but I knew there was a bathroom connected in the room, so I was going to go inside there so I could pray. And so when I went in the room to pray, the doctors came back, and what they said was, they said, uh, we're going to try to do something since there's nothing else we can do. And what we're thinking about is we're going to test you to see if you are still allergic to penicillin. The only thing that we could do at that time, they said that there was going to be three tests. They said they were going to do a skin test. It was some years ago. They were going to do a peel test and one other test. They came in the room, and I said, Dad, all right, we're going to pray. So when they gave him the test, and we said, we're going to come back and check the results. I went in the bathroom. I began to pray. I said, God, you got to do this for my father. The doctor said they can't do anything else. I know that you told me that you can do it. So, God, I'm believing for you to do it. I came back in the room. The doctors came back. They said, well, Mr. Ford, it looks like somehow you passed the first test. So when we continue, I came and I, I said, man, we got to praise God for that. Now we just got to take two more tests. So when we came, he took the second test, and the second test came, and they did another one, and they said, all right, we're going to uh, wait to see, and then in a few more minutes, we're going to do another test. So I went, and then I went back in the bathroom. I began to pray. I said, God, you did it once. I need you to do it again. So when he came, and I came back out the room, and then when I came and saw my father there again, they told him, they said, well, Mr. Ford, it seems like you passed the second test. So now he only had one more test, and he was on the brink of where the doctors had already told him it was nothing else that they could do. So when they came back, and they said, all right, we're going give you this in appeal form because this is the most potent form of how we can give it to you right now. So when they gave him the pill, we were waiting. I went back in the bathroom. I said, God, if you did it for the Father, you did it for the Son, you got to do it for the Holy Ghost. I said, God, you got to come through for me in this situation. And I began to pray like never before because I knew that when God does something in your life, he can turn the tables around. I don't care what the doctors say. I don't care what the report says. But if you have your trust in God, he'll make every thing all right yes he will yes he will what i love about god is that he knew how important that it was that even fast forwarding some years after that when my father got in the hospital again 2016 that i prayed fasted he was in there for some months he went through five cardiac arrests came back and there was a period of time where when he came back, he told me something that stuck with me forever. He said, and he always told me that he loved me, but this time it was different. He said, son, you know I love you? I said, I love you too. He said, son, do you really know that I love you? I said, yes, dad, I love you too. He said, do you know that if I had to die for you, I would die for you? And when he said that to me, it hit me in a different way because I had never heard my father say something like that. And especially being in that type of moment, it really hit me in my gut. Because it was, re it was revealing to me that my father loved me so much that he was willing to sacrifice whatever it took to make sure that I was ahead. And to have that type of father was something that I believe is so necessary for any child. That if you will love your child, if you will sacrifice for them, if you will give them what they need to grow, that child will be okay. Because you have to remember that your child is your legacy. Your child is the next generation. Your child is the one that is the extension of you. But I love what God did and he, what he knew because at that time... When, he, when we prayed for him in the hospital, that's around the time when I got connected to Apostle Langston. And it's crazy how the timeline worked because he came around right actually before the transition of my father. So God, in a way, was already grooming me for where it was that he wanted me to be. And when I think about how awesome God is and how even down to the fact that when my father died... God really helped me and sustained me and carried me through that season of time. But he started, he directed me immediately to know that this is where I needed to be connected. Now, I didn't know at that time anything really about spiritual father. I just knew that 
his life was an example that I wanted to live by and that I needed to learn from because when I lost my father, I was thinking, how is it that I'm going to learn the things that I want to learn? How, how, I still have more life to live. I'm not married yet. I don't have kids yet. Like, who's going to navigate me through this that I can trust? Because everybody doesn't have the life that I want. Wow. So it takes a certain type of leader in order to lead me to where God is taking me. And so it was even a prophecy that he gave me, and he told me, and I'm going to hurry up, where he said, where you've been is not conducive for where God has taken you. And the thing about it was he told me that even before my dad passed. So when I had prayed and fasted about that word that I got, God had already given me direction on where it was I was to settle before I even knew my dad was going to be out of here. So I love how God orchestrated the transition for me to know where I was to be placed before that even happened. Because of Apostle's role in this teaching the word and because he's a role model and example of how I want to grow and how I want to get older, he's a great father, a great husband, a great man of God, and an example. So when Apostle Paul talks about there are many instructors and few fathers, I've learned that this is basically the cheat code, that I don't have to figure it out on my own, that God has given me a spiritual father that I can look up to now that my father has passed, that I can look to him and Pastor Robin, even as a spiritual mother, although it's not Mother's Day, but I can look to her as well, even though my mother is here, because the things that I need to learn from her, I can learn from her as well. G and you, the thing about it, too, that was so amazing to me, they are the exact same ages of my actual parents. Wow. And I thought that was just like, wow, because you remind me a lot of personality of him as well. And, but what I wanted to say about that is that when you look at their ages, and we're talking about spiritual fathers and mothers, you cannot get caught up on their age. Because even Jesus, when he did ministry, he was between 30 and 33. Wow. So when we're talking about what they have, you have to realize this is a heavenly thing that they have. So when they're teaching you and guiding you as a spiritual father or spiritual mother, you've got to catch it from the realm of the spirit and not get caught up on your age versus their age. my closing. Venus and Serena became the best tennis players in the world because their father literally cultivated them into greatness. They became the greatest in the world because their father cultivated them. This is what God wants to do for you through the body of Christ. This is what God wants to do for you in your household because what happens is when it starts in the body of Christ and you catch God, then man, when you get that, you get to take it to your family. Then when you take it to your family, you become the priest of your home to where now you're bringing God to your house and then you are now their spiritual father even though you're submitted to a spiritual father because even he has a spiritual father. And when you catch that, you realize that this is how you get in the rhythm of being blessed. Yeah. Wow. Wow. If you want to go somewhere that you haven't been, see if you can find somebody that has it. That's right. See, I don't have to, for me, it made it easy because wow. I don't have to look around to see like, oh man, like, Who's going to teach me this or who's going to teach me that? Because I already saw that what I'm looking for, they already have. So it's easy for somebody to teach you how they got something that they already had. All you got to do is listen. That's right. That's right. So like Venus and Serena, they have been so developed by their father that when now, where I'm getting to my clothes here, that when you see them, you can't help but see their father. When you look at the story of how the vision for them to be tennis player wasn't even theirs. Wow. Their father drilled that vision into them and drove them to success. So now when you see them, you literally can see their father in them. So what happens is now we, as the people of God, have to come to a point to where we live a life to where now when people see us, they see our father, which they see our spirit, our God through our father because he's teaching us. So when they see us, now they should see God. When you come to a place when you are living a life for God, people should be able to look at you and see that you're living for God. People shouldn't have to wonder where did you get this from? Who are you living for? Because when you submit to God, you already got it. Let's praise God. Hallelujah. I'm over time. Hallelujah. I just really quickly 
Let's just pray in the spirit for one moment. For the Lord has a word. For the Lord saying that this is your season and hour where I'm elevating you to the next dimension. He said, get ready for even a call that's coming in between September and December. He said, this call is going to be so significant to you that when this call hits you, you're going to know that you're going to be traveling. He said, there's getting ready to be a call that comes that's going to cause you to go across the country. He said, when you get this call and you go across the country, let know that this is an indication in the realm of the spirit that I'm shifting you regionally and globally. He said that the next level of your ministry is getting ready to come, and I hear the word global very clearly. He said that get ready because... Because the world is yours. He said, there's people in the earth that have been waiting for your ministry. He said, but I had to position them and position you in the right time in the season for them to receive it. He said, because so many people have come and go and they've went with the left and went with the right, that they now are ready and they have to have listening ears to be able to receive what you have. He said, what you have is so pure that everybody can't receive it. But where he's getting ready to send you is going to be so clear. He said, you'll know the places you should go and the places that you should not. He said that this is the time where he's getting ready to to take you to a nation like never before. The prophetic is getting ready to come out of you and you're going to pierce the hearts of darkness. He said that devils are getting ready to be cast out. He said the testimonies that you have of the healings that have been done, he said greater work shall you do, says the spirit of the living God. <laughs>